Well, I would like to welcome Lauren Wittig to the Life Magnetics podcast. Lauren is an intuitive healer and spiritual mentor. She is trained in Reiki, shamanic journeying, and Acunect, and has a passion to help women recognize and unleash their innate and experiential wisdom, emotional, physical, and spiritual, so they can bring that wisdom consciously into their lives with confidence and joy. Lauren is also an award-winning author of many fantasy slash romance books and is the host of the Curiously Wise podcast. Welcome, Lauren, to Life Magnetics. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. Oh, we're going to have some fun. Um, Mm -hmm. I just... You have so much going on. Like, and so do I. I have, I'm about to have my fourth podcast. Oh my gosh. Talking about some, I'm doing it with my daughter in law, but I mean, and I've also got a YouTube channel. I used to write romance myself a long time ago. So (laughs) I was looking at all those books and I was like, oh my gosh. But I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. I want to start at the beginning. And why don't you just um, introduce yourself to everyone and tell us how you came into the work that you do? So I'm Lauren Wittig, and I have been on a journey to this, I think, my whole life. Um, Intuitive healer is sort of the main thing that I consider myself these days, though I do have a lot of other things going on. Um, I had a childhood that was filled with turmoil and um, family stuff and illness because I was constantly sick and had terrible allergies. And over the years, things got better and then they got worse and they got better and they got worse. Eventually I looked for some alternative help because medicine wasn't managing particularly the the, um, allergies anymore. And you know, the universe provides, right? Yes. (laughs) Um, So I got, I got connected through my best friend to an intuitive healer and in about an hour on the phone with her, my asthma went away. Wow. And it was amazing. And that's been, I don't know, eight or 10 years now, and it's never come back. And, you know, I was taking and I was using inhalers and allergy medicine, and all kinds of stuff and avoiding exercise. Cause that was a trigger and, you know, it just, mm-hmm. it was, yeah, no fun. But what that healer told me was that it wasn't a physical source. It was an emotional source. It was my mother sitting on my chest and wow which was, you know, after doctors have been trying to get you to do allergy shots and, you know, and take everything under the sun, that was eye opening. And yet there was something that clicked that made sense to me. And so she was able to help me move that energy out and release it. And um, like I said, it's been eight or 10 years. I've never had asthma since. Wow. So a couple of years later, I forgot that I had that wonderful experience with her. My allergies were getting worse. The asthma wasn't back, but the allergies were getting really bad. And I went to an allergist to get tested for shots. And at the end of the first, you know, they, they, they do it all under your skin on your arm. A- right. After the nurse had gotten all of the, the first day's tests in, I went into anaphylaxis, which I have never done in my life and scared the hell out of me. And I spent the night in the ICU being observed and, you know, it was fine, but I was reminded that there are other ways <laughs> to, to deal with things. And so I went back, eventually I went back to that healer again because my friend reminded me, you remember how your asthma disappeared? Maybe you should go back and see her again. I, I've been known to resist a few things spiritually, <laughs> <laughs> but I did. And this time I saw her in person and um, cause I was up visiting my friend, which is close by. And, um, and in another hour, my allergies were gone. And what she told me was that, well, the first thing she asked me was, what, what do you believe or what's your belief system? And I went, I was raised in the Episcopal church, but I don't go to church anymore. I didn't know what she meant. And she said, oh, that's okay. We'll get to it. And so about halfway through the session, she says, she says, you're afraid of everything. And I went, no, I'm not. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, when you just live in a normal way, you know, you, it's your normal life to be constantly on the alert for everything that might hurt you, harm you, put you into a state of conflict, um, you don't notice it. You don't know that's not normal. Um, And so when she brought it to my attention, like my mother sitting on my chest, it was an aha moment. And I walked out of that session going, that's what I wanna do. I wanna help people feel better where medicine, Western medicine is not able to help them. And that, that began the journey. I got very lucky that there is, there was an 
underground community here in Williamsburg, Virginia of healers. Who knew? This is a retiree town. It's like, you know, it's just not, it's not the kind of place you would expect to find a lot of, of spiritual outside of religion kind of spiritual um, people. But I got hooked into that community and some teachers came to me and I was able to learn a lot of things and I'm naturally intuitive with it, but it was nice to have sort of a structure to, to the, the language of it is what I needed from the teachers. Um, right. And so it's, yeah, so it's been quite a journey, <laughs> but uh, I got here in my fifties, mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's never too late. No. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah. And I just, I love doing the work. I love working with people and helping them to understand what they've like stuffed in their body and need to, to let go of. And, you know, they don't come to me until they're ready to do that. Correct. So it's, it's really, really joyful work for both of us, the client and me. I, I love it. It's, it's a high. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I want to just uh, say to everybody out there listening that I don't think Louise Hay started her book. You can heal your life yeah. until she was in her 40s or 50s. I know she started yeah. the Hay House in her 50s, but she started right. later in life. And look at all yeah. of the wonderful things she did with her life. So it is right. never too late no. to start. Um, but you said a few interesting things in, in your breakdown of your journey. And I kind of wanted to um, ask you some clarifying questions, if that's OK. okay. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I was curious when uh, your practitioner was working with you, was she using a specific modality like Reiki or was it a combination? She works with angels. Okay. Uh, in her office, she's got angel figurines everywhere. And, and the way she worked is she, she sat behind me and put her hand on my heart and then she received information and she would help. I got to watch her once working with my daughter. So I, cause I was sitting, I got to sit in the room and she's, she does. And I do the same sort of thing. She was pulling things out of my energy field and shaking them off. And then she would get more information and she would work on something else. And she would talk to me periodically, ask questions. With the fear stuff, she gave me a visualization. She said, you know, think of it as like little black worms just coming out of your body, just, you know, and each one is a fear and you can zap it with a, with your heart energy, with like a laser, you know? <laughs> and so she helped clear it. And I also use that visualization to help clear it, which made it happen pretty quickly. Um, so she doesn't, she personally doesn't have a specific modality. When I work with somebody, I often describe myself as being like a jazz musician, musician because I'm intuitive first, but I have studied Reiki. I'm a Reiki master teacher. I have studied Acunect, Acunect. It's a hard one to say. I don't use that one much anymore, but it's where I learned a lot about anatomy, which is very, very useful. Um, I work some with the, the idea of the meridians that the Chinese medicine uses. I work a lot with chakras. Um, I studied esoteric healing. I'm still studying that. So I, I like to collect modalities, but I don't work in any one of them. I work in whichever one is appropriate for that person at that moment in that day. Um, mm. And that's where the intuition comes in. Um, I think that's very powerful. And I've been to a lot of different practitioners in my day. I also have an academy where, you know, we, we train people up in different modalities. Mm -hmm. And I we always end up in a place where it's like, when you just learn how to become a vessel, like it's new every single time. And you right. really can't ever tell anybody exactly what a session is going to look like because spirit is moving and spirit is going to be doing something surprising and you just never yes. know. So the, the real trick in terms of healing, it's not a trick, but the real um, skill is to learn how to get out of the way. Right. And just right. be that vessel. Yeah, it's like, right? oh, we're using this today and that today and this today, because that's what spirit is saying. She need, you need some Reiki. Okay, now switch to over to this other modality. Okay, now use your intuition, you know. Right. And I get I get, I mean, yesterday I was working with a client and, um, two of her angels showed up and I was able to, I don't see them like they're standing in front of me, but I see them in my mind's eye. And I was able to, to describe them to her and they were able to communicate through me what their, what their particular point of being with her was. And it's so cool when stuff like that happens. Cause I'm not, I don't call myself a medium or anything like that, but I have, I have grandmothers show up a lot. I have, you know, fathers or grandfathers show up. I have uh, great, great grandparents show up sometimes. I don't know who they are, yeah, <laughs> but they come in and they want to talk to whoever's on the table and I act as the, as the translator for them. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. So it's just, I love it. It's like, it's always a mystery what's going to happen today. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, one of the things that you also said uh, was that your healer asked about your belief system, mm -hmm. which is so important because, of course, mm -hmm. our beliefs are 
actual energy that we carry inside of ourselves. And you, yes. you talk a lot on your site. I was reading through your site about storytelling, mm -hmm. but can you speak a little bit? Well, first one question, mm -hmm. if she had done the work that she was doing as your healer, but you did not believe that it was possible to be healed. Do you think that you would have been healed in the no. first place? Okay. I, I don't, I don't think so. I think if you don't believe you put up such resistance that you're not able to receive it. Um, right. And it's, it's a co-creation. I, it's not the healer doing the healing. I th it's really, I call myself a healer. I'm more of a facilitator um, and a guide. Um, and so if the person on the table isn't willing to, to co-create that with me or to, to be open to it, they might as well not come. You right. Know, it's not going to have any, any effect. So, um, okay. Yeah. So b belief, obviously on the part of the person being healed is, is paramount to the process. You have to be there present. Well, yeah. when she brought up your belief systems and asked you what you believed, what, what illuminated inside of you around that and how has your belief shifted since then? It's, it's amazing how fast things can shift when you just bring them into your consciousness, because all of that was subconscious in me. I didn't know I was afraid of everything. I thought I was very actually courageous and bold. Um, but, um, and you know, I, there are times in my life where I think I have been, but I didn't know that at that point in my life, I was afraid of everything. And allergies are always an expression of fear because allergies help to keep you contained. They keep you away from things. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that's always a sign of fear. Um, I spent so much of my life defining myself by what I wasn't going to be that I don't think I knew what my belief system was at the time. Um, I had, you know, very, I had an alcoholic dad and, and a narcissistic mother. And I, all I knew was what I didn't want to be. And I, I designed my life that way well into my forties, you know, um, but when I started to wake up, when I started to um, stick a toe in the, in the spiritual well, if you will, um, it just felt like coming home and it jives with it. It, 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 it beautifully blends with the way I wanted the world to be. You know, I loved reading fantasy. I loved, I, I talk about a lot, um, I was 17 years old when the original Star Wars movie came out and I was a geek. So, you know, I had to go uh, second. I was there for the second showing of it on the opening day. <laughs> um, and when they got to where they described the force as this energy that connects all, all things, all living things, I was like, that's it. That's what I believe. And then I didn't really think that we could have that in the world. You know, I wanted it, but I didn't know. So when she asked me what my belief system was, I, I totally kicked back to church and cause I was, I was raised in the Episcopal church. I went to an Episcopal boarding school for a couple of years. I was an acolyte. I was in the choir. I didn't you know the whole thing. Um, but I had left the church in my twenties because of, I didn't like the misogynistic sides of it. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have anything to tell her that of what I believed. All I believed was I didn't want to be my, my parents, you know? right. um, which is all fear. It was all fear of being like them. I didn't want to be like them. I'm not like them. I mean, I am in some good ways, but I'm not in the bad ways. Right. So, um, yeah. So the belief was a totally alien concept to me when she asked, I, I really didn't have any clue what she was talking about. Now, of course, I believe that we're all connected that, that we're here for a purpose. We all have our passions that, that help guide us to those purposes that we, we're all connected. And so whatever we do affects everything. I mean, there's that ripple effect that goes out. It affects the ones closest to you the most, but then it ripples out. And so, yeah, now I have a very robust belief system and I live in it every day and my life is so much the better for it. Would you say that you believe in God? I don't call it God, but yes, I call it great spirit or all that is, or the universe. And that's because of, you know, I left the church because I didn't like the way they had co-opted, you know, God. I didn't like the way they had relegated women to secondary status. Um, and I have an aunt who is an Episcopal priest. So it's not like women weren't making inroads, but I was actually, I left before she became, or maybe just after she became a priest, but, um, so for me, God was very triggering when I first started this and it just had too many, um, too much baggage with it. So I've chosen to call it anything else, but I'm comfortable with other people using God. It's cause it's the same thing. It's just this, this energy. You can call it the force, <laughs> you know, you can call it whatever you want to call it. 
it's it's just this unifying energy that that holds us all in its embrace and it's beautiful hmm. i love so. that i actually grew up um as a well well, my father, I grew up in Hawaii and my father was, he believed in the Hawaiian gods. And my father was also an alcoholic and very abusive. My mother was the abused party. And um, so I had a very traumatic childhood. And so I was looking for something outside of the home. I ended up in fundamentalist Christianity and Pentecostal Christianity. Oh my gosh. Snake wrangling, <laughs> a lot of people falling <laughs> over, speaking in tongues. Very, very psychic though. Very, very mm -hmm. psychic um, strain of mm. Christianity. And I was in that for over a decade. I was a missionary. I was a singer. I was doing all of the things for Jesus. But I too came to that kind of moment where I felt like this is just no longer working for me. And mm. I left and I went on my wandering journey, just trying to find God and, and reason that out for myself. And I think that for people who have spirituality kind of centered in their life, it usually is that you come to that place where you have to strike out on your own mm -hmm. and discover for yourself exactly who God yeah. is or who source is and how that's meant to be played out in your life. Yeah. So yeah, it's very, absolutely. it can be very frightening, you know, if you're mm -hmm. leaving a church and you're leaving your, your, the scaffolding of religion, but it's also so rewarding and source mm -hmm. or spirit never lets you down. And that's yeah, sure. never, never, never. Yeah. It's, um, it's gotten me through a lot of hard times in the last few years. So it's, you know, it's yes. parents passing and in-laws passing and, not always easily. And so, yeah, it's, it's knowing that there's a purpose to everything and being able to sometimes step back and go, what's in this. Here's one of my big lessons, especially in the last few years, what's in this for me, as opposed to why is this happening to me? Right. One of my greatest learnings from spirit, <laughs> you know, it's like, cause in hindsight, you can often see the lessons, but when you're in the midst of it, sometimes it's just, it's just overwhelming and awful. But I've always, I've been able to look back and go, yeah, I, I learned a lot. I'm a much, much stronger person. I grew a lot because of those experiences. Didn't like them, but you know, they have made me who I am today. And I like me a lot now. So, <laughs> well, I like you too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to talk a little bit about the mother on your chest, because I think that mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who are so interested in spirituality and really connecting in an evidential way to the world of spirit, but are also not conscious to trauma that they're harboring inside of themselves mm -hmm. or like things that offenses they have against other people. They're not conscious to it or they are, and they're just not ready to kind of get into it and face it and, and deal mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the importance of acknowledging and becoming conscious to these types of traumas, how you did that, and also like how you can begin to deal with them in a way that's not further tra traumatizing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the cornerstone of my work actually. Um, because I, in, my own, in my own journey, well, I, I'll take you back a little bit further than, than the mother on the chest. When I was in college, my family was all in denial about my dad being an alcoholic. It's a very classic alcoholic family sort of system that you get into. And I was falling apart. I was depressed. I didn't understand why I did just terrible stuff and I couldn't focus. And I was, you know, not happy. And I got in my mailbox, I got a little slip of paper that said one of the deans was starting a group for children of alcoholics. And it's like, it was illuminating because somebody had finally used the word alcoholics. And I knew instantly that this was something I needed, that it was, it was something that I could, you know, benefit from. Um, and I'd actually gone for, to the school psychologist to get some help. And he only wanted to talk about my mother and I only wanted to talk about my father. You know, <laughs> so, so this was the thing that came up. That group was a community of people. And I, you, I looked at on your website, you have the, um, the lab, I think you call it. Yes. Um, it's, it was a community of people who had similar, not identical, but similar experiences with alcoholic parents and alcoholic family systems. And the first three meetings I went to, I couldn't speak. I would cry, but I couldn't speak. But slowly I began to open up and share and realized that everything I was feeling really was because of my dad's alcoholism. And I'm not even gonna blame him. The alcoholism runs in the family. Um, and that I could choose to step out of that system. It took me a while to figure out how to do it. And a lot of years ago into Al-Anon meetings and ACOA meetings, but 
I went home and I 12 stepped my dad at 21, when I was 21, which is in AA's speak for confronting them basically in a loving way. He was sober for 20 years before he died. Um, that was the first time where I realized looking back that once I could name something, I could do something about it. And so I've, I've used that in my life in a lot of ways. Um, my son, when he was a baby had asthma, but nobody would call it asthma. You know, you have to have it this many times. And I said, okay, so what, if it were asthma, what would I do? <laughs> you know? And that got us onto the road of uh, things. But so with my clients and with my own healing, that, that need to bring something into consciousness is the first step to dealing with any of it. And we hide it from ourselves because we don't want to feel it. We don't want to deal with it. So it takes some bravery at first. But one of the things that I do for my clients and with my clients is that I work with them so we can reveal it. I call it, I actually call it revealing it or bringing it into the light because I'll find it stuck in like their hips or knees or wherever they're having pain and it'll come up and it always comes up because they're ready to deal with it, even if they don't think they are. Um, and we, I bring it up and I tell them what I found and we talk about it a little bit. They'll usually know exactly what it is exactly. You know, I can, sometimes I'll say, you know, I think you were like maybe 11 or 12 and they'll go, oh yeah, I remember that, you know, and we talk about it, but it's in this safe, caring heart light space. So they don't have to relive the trauma. They need to recognize it. They need to, to welcome's not the right word, but embrace it in terms of healing it. And then they can let it go, but they get to keep the wisdom of it. And that's the gift. So the gift for doing the work of revealing it, bringing it up and, and finally dealing with it, because if you keep stuffing it, it's just going to get worse and worse. So if you deal with it, you get to keep the wisdom of that. And to me, that is, that's what we're here to do is we're here to have these experiences and learn from them. We're not meant to drag them around with us for the rest of this lifetime because that's right. no fun. <laughs> we should be having fun. We should be living in joy, you know, as much as we right. can. <laughs> well, that's a, a radical statement for um, so much of the world right now that we, yeah. so much of the collective seems um, very interested to stay in a, um, an energetic disposition of being triggered and offended yeah. and upset yeah. and fear and anxiety. Like it is it, it, reaching a fever pitch, obviously it's, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, some people would say it's very overwhelming, especially if they were empaths or they yes. have a hard time just even leaving the house. We left the house yesterday. We went to a restaurant and mm -hmm. I realized <laughs> there were cows in this person's uh, yard. There were like a, a new house going. I hadn't left my house in so long. Like I <laughs> like so um, interested in just, uh, I guess, preserving my my natural state, because when you go mm -hmm. out, uh, there's a lot that's out there. That's a little yeah. bit. It's a little bit disturbing. So. To yeah. that end, how would you um, help someone who might be feeling, I, I bet you a lot of empaths are attracted to you. Oh, yes. <laughs> speaking, but like, how do you help someone who is in a state of overwhelm because of everything going on in the world, much less their life? Like, what are some of the first steps you take people through to kind of reclaim their center and their peace? Well, the, the thing I find most often that I have to do first is teach them how to ground themselves. Because when... I know with myself, whenever I get stressed, I want to leave my body. It's like, leave that behind. It's not, it's, it's in pain. It's not feeling good. It's, you know, emotional, whatever it is. I want to go up here and play in the energies of the high vibration because that's where it's really fun. But that we, we don't get to, if you do that, you don't work through anything. You know, it's so, so one of the first things, and it's one of the first things I had to learn how to do is to really be present in the body and connected to the earth because our bodies evolved from the earth and we are made of the same stuff as the earth. And that energy, I call it the great mother, is the most nurturing energy our physical body can receive. And there's literally earthing where you go out barefoot and you walk in the earth and you sit on the ground, whatever. It's magical. It changes your, your charge, the charge of your ion, not ions. Anyway, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. Um, I get but, it. <laughs> But so, so teaching people how to ground themselves and what that even means, um, is 
almost always the first thing we do in a session with somebody with a, for the first time. And I love the visualization of if I were a tree, I have, you've got a tree behind you, mm -hmm. um, those roots going deep down into the earth and absorbing the energy of mother earth. And then you can pull it up just as if it were water up into your body. And then you can go all the way out the top, connect to the universe and, and have this sort of, um, it's like, you know, a plug needs to be, you know, plugged in in two places. We need to be plugged in in two places above and below, um, to really be in a healthy flow of energy through us. So that's, that's the very first thing I do. The other thing is I talk to them about boundaries because one of the things I had to do, my mother had dementia for 10 years, 11 years before she passed and she was a narcissist. So it's like a double whammy. <laughs> you know? And I really was just, you know, seriously getting on this when all that started. And I had a really hard time with her for a lot of those years because I'm, I'm not an only child, but I might as well be because my brother's eight years older and lives in Arkansas and I'm in Virginia. Mom was here. Um, and so I became, you know, her husband and I became the primary people in her life. I, because I'm an empath, I would walk in and it would be like somebody was throwing glass at me. You know, I didn't, didn't really see it that way at the time, but looking back, I can see that, but I did learn to create boundaries. And one of them, and I was just teaching a client this yesterday. I, I would imagine that I had like one of Harry Potter's invisibility cloaks almost, you know, but with mirrors on the outside. And I would only, I asked that only emotions that were good for me or were meant for me come through in a high vibration, um, come through and everything else get reflected back as love. And I always use the term from whence it came, you know, it's just a great term. Um, and doing that was very powerful because it did allow me to still feel things, but not to be overwhelmed by them. Um, I actually, I did that so strongly. One time as I was driving to my mom's, I was actually praying, which is uh, not something I do regularly, but just please, you know, please wrap me in light, wrap me in light so I can't, I'm not damaged by my mother. I don't, you know, my energy was so depleted by the two, three days later, I realized I had wrapped myself up so tightly. I wasn't getting the energy I needed. <laughs> so, so there's a happy medium in there somewhere. But so grounding and boundaries, those are always, always, especially with impasse the first two things that we have to talk about and, 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 and practice. So yes. yeah, that's where I'd start. Awesome. And for anyone listening, I would also say to, and I, I know Neville Goddard talked a lot about putting yourself on an information diet or just, mm. and, and you're familiar obviously with allergies, like slowly phasing out mm -hmm. things in order to try and find what the thing is that's right. giving you the reaction. Like in the energy, it's important to do that as well. Like slowly mm -hmm. phase out things and just no, learn, cultivate the capacity to notice that so many people yes. are just unconscious. <laughs> we're just that's like, what I was just about to, to add. <laughs> Starbucks. Yeah. Like we don't even notice we're in a state of tension or a state of aggravation because we're not checking in with ourselves, but to notice when you're feeling any of that so that you can take that breath and get back to center and to slowly start to remove things that you notice are making you feel low right. vibe, which right. is to say tense or fearful or whatever it is, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. be proactive in lessening some of those things, getting them out of your life, I think is so very helpful. Right. 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 And one of, one of the places I do that is with news. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Right. It's like, I no, no, <laughs> no, uh, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, here's your daily dose of, um, insanity and, yeah. um, yeah. just yeah. right at your heart chakra. It's, it's, um, it's can be very debilitating, which is why people probably don't want to leave their house sometimes. But I mean, right. I don't, but I've trained myself not to um, listen to the news. You know, what I'm working on is just social media because in my, my business and my work, I'm on social media. So mm -hmm. I have to be on platforms, but at the same mm -hmm. time, it's like, how do I be in it, but not of it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The world. How do you, how do you, let's create that boundary, you know, right. it's that, yeah, it's, um, and noticing, I think is such a skill because nobody teaches us how to do that in our, in our culture. And that's something that I had to learn, you know, it was like, okay. And now I'll have uh, days where I go, God, I feel like I'm kind of, kind of stuffed up and my eyes are itchy. What's going on? Okay. And I have to stop and listen. Often I have to go meditate really to get quiet enough to go to understand why I'm getting just that little tiny bit of allergy reminder, you know, Ooh, there's something going on. <laughs> 
Um, and sometimes I figure it out very quickly and sometimes I don't. And then I have to suffer for a couple of days, just nothing like I used to, I don't even have to take medication for it, but it's just like, just a little reminder, this could get worse. <laughs> so, right. so deal with it now. Um, but that noticing that, that listening to something other than that ugly voice that we often have in our heads, listening to our heart, um, can really help us be aware of what's good for us and what's not good for us. Yes. I loved what you said about, um, or implied that like the things that are physically wrong with us or what well, that's a judgment. So mm. the things, the symptoms that we carry around things that hurt, <laughs> right? Like my hip, my sciatica, mm -hmm. my knee, this or that, mm -hmm. um, there is an energetic correlate every single oh, time, every single time. Usually it's created in the energy before it crystallizes in the physical body. Yes. But yeah. yeah. So would you say that each symptom has a story to tell? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that I've categorized it by, you know, this sure. kind of pain or that kind of illness, but every, I mean, I, I talk about with most of my clients, if not all of them come to me because of some sort of pain, it might be emotional pain, might be physical pain. They don't usually key in that it could be sort of a spiritual, you know, thing that they're resisting or, but, but there's something that brings them in because it's bothering them. Um, and probably nine times out of 10, if not more often than that, it is physical pain. And it's a physical pain they've lived with for a while. It's getting worse. Medications aren't helping anymore. The doctor wants to do surgery or wants to do, you know, put you on 16 other different medications or something, you know, and they, and as with me, with the asthma and uh, it, you know, there's gotta be a better way kind of thing. You know, what else, what else is out there? And, um, and that's when people tell me, yeah, I just went to see sort of if there was anybody who did this kind of thing and you popped right up on the Google search. It's like, mm, yeah. <laughs> um, but we work after we ground and we, and we um, learn about boundaries. I start just, I, I work with my hands. I, you know, I, I feel energy in the palms of my hands. So I, I just start sort of seeing what's present in their body. And I always start with the chakras because that's the big picture. Um, and I've learned over a couple of years now, several years now that, it doesn't do any good to work on the details until the big picture is sort of balanced and, and steady and stable. Um, so it's usually two or three sessions before we actually get to what might be the source of the pain or at least a piece of it, because often it's layers of things, but, um, but there's always some story there. And I get, I get, <laughs> you know, I mentioned, I, I saw angels, you know, from my client last night, I get song lyrics that don't mean anything to me. You know, it could be a song I haven't heard since I was a kid or, or that I've never heard. It's like, I think this is a song or maybe, you know, always meaningful to the person I'm working with always, or I'll get an image. I got an image once of, of a, a woman who I was working with sitting on a, a stone. She was, she felt like a child, but she looked like herself. Um, and she had her face in her hands and she was crying. And I'm like, I don't know. And I didn't, I had never met her. We were in a class just trading, you know, practicing for things. I, I said, I don't, I don't understand this image, but let me tell you what I'm seeing. And she knew exactly what it was. She knew exactly how old she had been in that moment. She knew exactly what the problem was. And that meant we revealed it. We brought it up out of her subconscious. So then I was able to help her move it energetically through and out of her body. And she got off there smiling and standing up straighter and feeling good. And it was like, it's just, it's miraculous how fast things can change once you're willing to look at it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about the storytelling aspect because I think that there's a hiccup with me. So I want to hash it out with you, okay. <laughs> which is this, and, and I've been in, you know, years and years and years of um, talk therapy analysis, therapeutics uh, because of my past. Mm -hmm. And there came a point where I became aware that the talking about it all the time was actually embedding this specific mm -hmm. story in, in making it more difficult for me to actually liberate myself from my trauma. Mm -hmm. And so um, I stopped going to therapy and I started looking at other sort of energetic modalities. I do notice that people tend to be fond of their stories. And it, it, usually when it's around, um, this happened to me, I was a victim of this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm this kind of a survivor or I'm that kind of a person. And they attach their experience and their identity really right. to the story. And so I think there's 
obviously lots of ways the story of your life the story of your body the story of your mind is very very important to mm -hmm. listen to and work with but can there be like attachments to stories we tell ourselves about ourselves oh. and others that keep us from a state of wholeness yes absolutely and and i'm still working through the stories um because they tend to be so we, we've told them to ourselves for so long they become beliefs you know if you keep saying the same thing over and over again you tend to believe it but it also it keeps you sort of trapped in that limitation of whatever that story kept or you know is about um and yeah so so first of all it's that recognizing that it's a story you know it it was probably an event something happened that's embedded it you were probably you know not as old as you are now <laughs> when it happened um the stories that i held on to for so long around my my allergies issues were from my childhood some of them were from before i actually remembered but they came up when other healers were working with me um and bringing i caught like i said i caught bringing it into the light bringing those stories into the light and going and i actually worked with um a great guy last weekend um he did a, a whole webinar and he works with stories we tell ourselves and he, he what he asks is are you ready to step out of that story now and I thought that's a brilliant question and I, I haven't thought about it that way I think about it, clearing the story but are you ready because that puts responsibility on the person who who created the story who owns the story they have to co-create the wellness they can, if they're ready, then they can let it go. We can help move it out quickly. Um, and so, yes, I think as long as we hold on to those stories, there's going to be some something that we still need to bring up into the light and work with. And I will tell you that I have a right knee that has been a problem for me since pu puberty. I've worked with a number of, of people over the years in different modalities, and it gets better and it gets worse and it gets better and it gets worse. I know there's a story in there, but for whatever reason, either I'm not ready to find it, or I haven't hit the right person who's able to, to help pull it out for me. Um, I know that if I release that story, my knee's going to be a lot better. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. just, I know it, but I don't know what the story is. And so it's how, probably, how are you, you going to figure that out? Do you, well, what's going to happen? <laughs> I, I, um, I talk to my guides a lot. I ask for help. I'm, um, I, I talk to my knee occasionally. I, you literally will talk to my knee. What do you need? What do you need? And I, honestly, for me, I trust that when I'm ready, the right person will appear to help me do it. And I have several healers that I see, you know, I, we, we trade healing practices for each other. So I know that somewhere along the line, that one's going to be ready. I accept now that it's not yet. I wish it were. I don't know why I'm still resisting that story. Um, but I know there's a story in there. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah. And and that's the thing about refinement through your life or healing, like progressive, just attunement through your life. Mm -hmm. Like I thought I dealt with my dad. I've been dealing with my dad for, I mean, 50, mm -hmm. 54, like for many, many years. And I, mm -hmm. just when you think you've healed it, here comes something up bubbling to the surface. Yeah. And I used to get exhausted and aggravated. Oh, like this again. Mm -hmm. I have now like nurtured um, kind of a, a perspective of gratitude. Like, okay, this is just, I'm invited to go even deeper. Right. I'm invited to the new lesson or the new mm -hmm, perspective. Mm -hmm, I'm invited mm -hmm. to like release something else, which is going to get me to the next level. Right. So I've made a positive association with like mm -hmm. the things that are always coming up. When I was a child, because the trauma was so acute, like I, I don't remember at least 50% of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And so um, as I continue to do my own spiritual work and my own, and and my own development, I find a lot of these memories just coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. And I use my breath to just be present with them. I try not to judge it. I try not to spiral into reaction. Yes. I try to use the breath and intention to just let that, here it comes, thank you, it's going now. I let it move, yes. energy's right. trying to move. And so instead of getting um, exasperated with the process, like, oh, just notice, oh, it's, it's moving. I'm yeah. healing. It's another opportunity. I'm getting better every single day. Yes. Yes. Well, healing works in a spiral. 
So, you know, when we first start out and you and I sound like we started kind of in the same way, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's heavy and hard and difficult. And, and I, I resisted because I was so angry and I was, I, I was embedded in that victim mentality and that kind of thing. So the first lesson was really hard. And then the next lesson was hard. And the next lesson was still hard, but they get easier as you go along because you've dug a lot of the, the, you know, the heavy stuff out, but also because you notice it faster. It's, it's definitely that, oh, here it comes again. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> right. <laughs> I recognize this. Okay. And I've gotten to where, I mean, I still, I've been working on my mother's stuff for 62 years. Mm-hmm. She's been gone for four years. You know? <laughs> right. Right. But I had a session last week with, with somebody and she was like, well, there's something here about your mother. And I'm like, oh, that again. <laughs> right. Know? But she was able to bring it up to into the light for me. We talked about it a little bit and then we were like, okay, that's gone. You know, it's, it, it where before it took me years to get through the first level of it, you know, if not more, more than a few years. So it is, it comes back at you, but it is some part of it is, okay, let's see if she's really got it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. She did really well. Okay. Let's try one. Oh, look almost immediately. Oh, yep. Didn't even bother that time. Right. It's like, so you're just going up and up the spiral. And part of it is our, as we heal things, our natural state of being our vibration, sort of our base vibration rises. So we can deal with things easier and easier because we're not in that low energy that we were, that we started in. Yes. So, and I think, yeah. um, uh, spirit is always creating and creative. Mm-hmm. And I think what I start to geek out on with just the process of, you know, my life and refining is that I get to use all of this yes. and in the capacity of my work, I get to share all of this. And when mm-hmm. I figure something out, I can turn around and tell the next person, Hey, this is how I did it. Like here, mm-hmm. heads up, this might work for you. It's all right. utilizable. It's all good. And it all comes back to service in the end. So yeah, it's so, all wisdom. It is. It's all wisdom. And we get to use that and share it. Yeah. And, and I find that the most powerful healers, the most powerful teachers, the most powerful inspires come from trauma that's not Mm -hmm. an absolute but it's people Mm -hmm. who've had a lot that they had to work through that they had to call forth the inner resources to even be willing to do it then employed all Mm -hmm. kinds of processes and started to figure it out for themselves and amass knowledge and now here they are like helping other people to come up too right yeah yeah and that's the fun getting to share that to make it useful yes you know to make it make it useful yeah well maybe can you speak on that a little bit? Because I think a lot of people are interested in healing and would love mm-hmm. to learn something like Reiki mm-hmm. or another type of a healing modality, but they've considered themselves to be somewhat broken. Maybe I don't have it all together yet. I've still got these things that I'm harboring. I've still got work that I need to do. My physical body's not well. Can people like this who feel the, feel about themselves in this way step into healing themselves? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's... it's um... I, I love Reiki. I, I actually, Reiki is probably the last thing that I've added to my, my okay. <laughs> vast modalities, but I love it because you don't have to have, like, you don't have to be able to see things like I do. You don't have to be able to even get information. It's the gentle and it's, it's anybody can do it. It's, you know, it's just that it's simple. And the thing about being a healer and working with other people is every time you do healing work for somebody else, you get it too. Right. And that's the real gift of being a healer is that I get to benefit as I help you. It's a win-win. So it's, um, so no, I started, God, if I had waited until I got, you know, completely all together, I still probably wouldn't be a healer, (laughs) but it's, it's, um, if you come into it with the idea that I don't know everything and that's okay, but I can do this, you'll find people that that is what they need. And as you learn more, you'll, people will be attracted to what you already, you know, what you now know. Um, so it's like any other skill you'll grow in it by doing it. I'm a big believer in just jumping in because I used to wait until everything was perfect and nothing ever happened. Um, so I, I really, at this point in my life, I'm a big believer in, and, you know, I started a podcast in April. I kind of knew what I was doing. But right. I've learned so right. much since <laughs> now I look back and go, yeah, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so, but I ha- I've had fun learning and I've had great guests who were willing to, to, you know, roll with me while I learned. And, and so it's, um, yeah, don't wait. Life is too short to wait to do something that's so, I don't know, meaningful and 
just a beautiful thing to, to offer to yourself and to other people. 100%. Yes. I mean, there's a place for the wounded healer. I think we're all wounded mm -hmm. healers. Oh right? yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah. I don't know any healer who's not still working through it. And mm -hmm. one of my teachers has been doing this, I think for 18 years now, and I work on her now, <laughs> you know, yeah. she, she and I trade pretty regularly and, um, and there we're still, we're still digging stuff out for each other, you know? Yeah. And, um, but we're every time I work on her, I get it too. <laughs> That's right. Cause you're the vessel yeah. you're holding the energy. Right. And I, and I think that everybody, sh we should disabuse people of the notion that like the work ends, <laughs> the work doesn't end until we end on this, in this incarnation, yeah. it's going to be right. going on if you're willing yeah. to do the work. If you're willing. Yes. Yeah. And, so I wanted, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Fun. I was just going to say it's, I was going to say it's fun and that's not necessarily always true, but it's always interesting. Yeah. I always learn from it. And that's the fun part is the learning. So, yeah. yes. I wanted to ask you, because you've mentioned guides, and I have a lot of listeners who are into psychic abilities and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Can you speak a little bit about your guides, how you met them, who they are? What's going on with that? <laughs> well, I have so many now that I refer to them as my all y'all. Okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I grew up in the deep South, so all y'all is a very comfortable term for me. Yeah. Um, I don't know which one came forward first. Um, I, I, I've never been one who needed to know a name or who they were necessarily, but they're more of a feeling for me. Some of them do have names. I have, um, one of the very first one that, that showed up to me, she probably was the first one. She barely ever talked to me. I have other ones that won't shut up, <laughs> but, um, she showed me symbolically that her name was golden Eagle woman. And. I learned much later that her role in my life was to hold my fear, mm -hmm. which I definitely needed. And I still call on her every now and then. Could you hold this for me? I don't want it back. Just hold it for me. You throw it away when you're ready to. <laughs> right. Um, but she's a very grandmotherly feeling presence. Um, I have a shaman um, who I call grandfather. His name is Wagatanika. It took me about a year to learn how to say that. Um, and as I began to work um, on reclaiming my shamanic memories, basically. Um, he was there as a guiding, a guiding force. Again, not in words always, but more like a, a gentle direction, you know, like, no, not quite there. How about over? There? Oh, look, look at the pretty thing over there. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, I've worked with um, Archangel Michael. I didn't particularly like Michael's energy. He's really very, Why? very masculine. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> Powerful, strong. <laughs> powerful, strong, but also very like organized and linear in the, mm -hmm. the ways that he was. And I don't, I'm not a linear thinker. So that didn't work for me. Um, I have one. I love her. Um, her name is Surreal. She's an angel. And um, she, a friend of mine, she was with, a, you know, she was a guide for a friend of mine. And, she, and my friend was telling me about her. And I was like, oh, I need an angel like that. She's like, I can do with you too. <laughs> <laughs> and she is, it's really, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but she is my personal shopper. Okay. Do I hate to shop. I okay. hate to shop. And so I will say things, and this was her suggestion. So I will say things like, um, I really need a pair of hiking pants. I've got a trip coming up and I don't have the right kind. And, and I think I know what I want, but I don't know where to get. It. I can't find it anywhere. Surreal, could you go see if you can find that? And let me know when you do it and where to go. And I will get a hit. Sometimes it's within minutes. Sometimes it's two weeks later. I had to go shopping right now. And I know exactly which store to go to. And it's not like she says, okay, so you're going to go to Columbia and you're going to go back. But I know I got to go to this store. I got to go to the back corner. And on that rack, there's going to be exactly the right pant. And I literally did this. <laughs> it was like the first time. And, you know, it was in my size. It was on sale. It was, you know, it's like, wow. <laughs> so I have just, I've gotten to where when I, when I want something, I'll go surreal. Let me know when you find it and awesome. it'll pop up and, 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 you know, I'm on an Amazon email that I get, or I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll just get that urge. Oh, I got to go shopping. Um, and I'm not a shopper. So when I get that urge, I know it's her. How do you spell so, her name? If I may ask S A R E A L. Okay. Interesting. Um, and then I have, um, I have recently, recently I asked, I I've been guided by a collection of voices, I would say for a, quite a long time now, but I've never really asked them for a name. And I recently asked them what I could call them. Um, and they call it, they said that, that to call them the community of light. 
And so I don't know exactly how many, I would say there's probably maybe six or eight different feeling presences that have come through me. I, I can channel them. That's how, that's how they came to me. Um, but I also use them. I, I talk to them individually for myself. Um, some of them present female, some of them present male. Um, I, I have this feeling sometimes in my head when I'm channeling that um, they're trying, they're, it's like they're jockeying for position who gets to talk today. You know? <laughs> so I have, I collected them, uh, you know, from all, I just, uh, they've come to me when I needed them, I think. Um, and I know that early on I had, I had a few that were helping me with the writing because I was writing a new kind of book and I would just channel it basically. And so they did that. It hasn't gone anywhere yet, but, um, but they kind of left when I didn't need that anymore. Right. And then, so some of them come and go, um, Archangel Uriel was with me for a while and, and, but I don't see him much anymore. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, but I do have this sort of community that, that likes to be around and, um, so I just invite in my all y'all and some of them are angels and some are ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, some are power animals. Um, I have uh, earth elementals that I work with. Um, so that's, I, I just said, I don't want to forget anybody and hurt their feelings. You know? so it's just the collection. So yeah, Gu guides can be anything. I mean, really, um, and they can come to you at any time and you can ask for them. Um, I mean, I basically asked for Surreal to do my shopping for me. <laughs> it's just, you know. Right. Well, I, I went to a, an angel workshop once and the teacher said that the angels are like this huge unemployed workforce, just mm -hmm. waiting for a job. Like somebody yeah. just give me a job. Like you got to right. ask me for it. You got to give me permission to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you do mm -hmm. it, they will help you on every single level from every the most level. minute thing. Yeah. What do I wear today to the most grandiose yeah. thing, like life purpose and whatnot, but they're there, they're around. They are. And you don't have to know specifically, you know, a name or right. what, what they are even, you can just say, and I, I did this early on and it still works. I would like to always have easy left turns. <laughs> I should have thought of that. <laughs> I'm writing that and, down. <laughs> and, and to this day, I, I, it's, it's so rare that I have to wait for a left turn. Um, or that, you know, there's one place I, I take my dog to doggy daycare once a week and coming out of there at five o'clock in the afternoon is it's a traffic jam in both directions on this is one little connector road. And I, as long as I go, okay, give me my easy left turn. And I don't ask, have to ask specifically for it every time, right. but I do there because it's, it's a complicated little area. Right. And once I remembered that, oh yeah, I can ask for that, even though I've got a standing order for it, but um, it, I never having a problem getting out of there. Um, <laughs> that's great. And that's okay. You can ask for silly things. I asked early on, I asked, and I think this was probably golden Eagle woman that I asked, I needed to be reminded that there was magic in the world because I was learning how to raise up to a higher vibration when I was around other people that were spiritual. And then I would crash down to my, my baseline again. And I didn't like it. I wanted to be able to stay up there, but I didn't have any way to remind myself of that when I wasn't around other people. So I asked for feathers as a symbol of magic because birds are kind of magical. They fly. You know? <laughs> it's like, um, and in that first year after I asked for that, I have, I have bouquets of feathers in my house. I got wow. so many feathers and I still get them. I got a blue jay feather this morning in our garden. Um, but more and more often I go, oh, look, it's a feather. I don't need to pick it up, <laughs> you know? right. but it's just a little reminder. And, and so, yeah, don't, it's not like you've got to, you know, have a, a worthy request. No, they, like you said, they're waiting for it to help you out. Right. They can make life easier and you just have to ask. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I also want to, I, what time is it? Oh, I've, I've kept you already. So I'm going to just ask good. you okay, a couple more questions, but I just, I'm enjoying I myself. To, <laughs> me too. I wanted to ask you about past lives and ancestral healing. Cause I'm wondering if when you're getting into somebody's energy as an intuitive healer mm -hmm. and as a guide, whether we trip out of this timeline and go into other timelines and whether we can carry in our physical body and in our mindset, patterns from grandmother, great grandmother, great grandfather, and how that shows up. And if it does in the work that you do. Yeah. I actually really love working with past life stuff. Um, I do pretty regularly find past life stuff that, that bubbles up when I'm working with people. Um, 
especially if they've had something since childhood, uh, that often, uh, that'll be my first thought. And I bet that's past life um, because it, we come in, we bring things, but you know, it's when we're swallowing so many things that we end up creating pain. So if you have had problems since childhood, very likely there's a past life there. I can't say hundred percent of the time because I haven't worked with enough people to, to know that. But, and for me, it's like those angels that showed up yesterday. Um, I get, I get a hit. I, get, I call it a hit. I'll get a vision or I'll get a knowing um, or I'll get a feeling. Um, and I can usually tell that it's not this lifetime. There's just something about the energy of it or the, if it's visual, sometimes there's clothing or, you know, something that will give it away a little bit of, of the timeline. Um, and those are some of the most powerful healings because it's not a story we're carrying with us consciously. It's not one we even know that we came, that we brought with us. Um, and I just, um, at this, this workshop I was in last week with the guy who said, you know, are you ready to step out of that story? I, we were, I got, I got to work one-on-one -on -one with him for a little bit. And he, you know, he, he found this money thing that I have. And cause I've, I've always had a hard time asking for money and this sort of thing. And I've been working on that for years now, mm -hmm. but you know, I said, I said, I think I got it from my mother. Cause was, you know, she used to tell me that I had enough and I didn't, I didn't deserve any more. Cause there were people who, you know, starving in the world and that kind of thing. And he said, no, it doesn't feel like your mother it feels, it feels like it's, it's older than that. I said, well, maybe my grandmother, because my grandmother kind of is the same one that planted that in my mom. And that was in the time of the depression in the deep South, it was a very hard time. And they, and my mom's family did have a bit more than everybody else. Cause my grandfather had a job. Um, and I was like, really? Okay. That, yeah, that makes sense. And so he helped me. He asked me, are you ready to step out of that ancestral story? It's only two generations back, but still it's an ancestral story. And I said, yeah, let's get it out of here. And, and it cleared. And I cannot tell you how light I felt. I woke up the next morning and I was like, oh, I'm going to do this for my business. I'm going to get this going on. I'm going to get this. Like, and I have been the whole week. I have just had a different energy. So very quickly, once you discover those, they can be cleared. Um, often easier than something you've carried around from this lifetime. Um, Interesting. The other piece of that is I love doing that work through the shamanic modality, doing um, soul retrieval journals, uh, journeys basically is what it comes down to usually. And those for me are really fun because they are very otherworldly. Um, it, is, it is going to a different dimension, a different, a different reality. Um, right. And those are very symbolic. And I find that symbolic things actually are, have more profound impact on people in the healing sense than those literal stories we've been telling ourselves since we were 10, you know, um, they just speak to us on a completely different level. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there's that. And right now there's this whole, there is a whole clearing of ancestral pain, ancestral trauma. Um, and it's, it is one of the things that um, I've worked on in my own line um, and that I work on with, with clients as well. Um, there is a modality. I don't do it. It's, it's fascinating. It's called um, family constellations. And okay. I, I highly recommend you looking into it because it is really looking at where in the family did this start. And the first time I participated in one, it's a, it's a group activity. It is the weirdest, wonderfulest thing. Um, but the first time I did it, we had to go seven generations back to figure out the trauma of the women in my mother's line. Wow. Yeah. Um, which is actually really interesting because my parents are fifth cousins and the way the genealogy worked, it made me my own seventh cousin. So going back seventh generations and me being the one to trigger the healing of the line was really meaningful mm -hmm. to me. You know, it was, mm -hmm. uh, really, wow. <laughs> but cause both sides of my family benefited from it. Um, so when you do, when you conduct the healing through you, um, you're the anchor in, in the moment, mm -hmm. are you, you're healing yourself, releasing yourself from that, which has kind of been visited upon you through the ancestry, right. but are you also, cause there's no time and space outside of this mm -hmm. dimension. Mm -hmm. Are you also liberating yes. the ancestors back then? And they're yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. I, I keep being told that it's seven generations back, but I keep thinking 
well, if I'm healing by healing it here, I'm also reverberating back seven generations. And by the way, forward seven generations. Right. But if that person that was the seventh one is healing, then isn't she also healing seven generations mm -hmm. back? You know? mm -hmm. So I don't quite understand, you know, why it, it's just that far back, but um, it's, it's hugely transformative. And it's, I mean, like I did it because I have a daughter. I don't want her carrying the same shit forward. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And, and for myself, obviously. Right. <laughs> um, but I also so think that that was part of the healing that happened between my mother in the last couple of years of her life, especially in the last year of her life. Um, I think it was, it was a layer that I needed to understand in order to be able to understand her better. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't do that modality. It is, it is a, a, a unique one and it is powerful and it takes the right person to lead it, mm -hmm. but it, I highly recommend it for the ancestral kinds of, of healing work. It's fascinating. I'm going to look into it. Family yeah. constellations. Okay. Family constellations. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, you know, in the work of Neville Goddard, he talks about how you can time travel in the mm -hmm. imaginal mind. And you can imagine, and you're talking about soul retrieval, mm -hmm. you can imagine yourself going back in time to that seven-year-old girl that you were at the time that that thing happened mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. changed you forever. And you can actually, but from an empowered place, like, and, and I just, I envision it as filling up and charging up with like love, which is the highest mm -hmm. vibration. Mm -hmm. And then going, doing that time travel back into my timeline and changing the story and, and neville says you can actually rewrite it rewrite mm -hmm. what was said to you rewrite what was yes. done to you imagine it in a different way right. and in doing so you you take the energy i think the energetic um trauma out of that moment but you also it has that echo all the way into the present moment it opens mm -hmm. up it frees you here and then it calls forth all these different outcomes yeah. and potentials because potentials, now you're yes. at a different level and you can attract those to yourself right. i think that work just in the imagination i mean you mm -hmm. can go to someone and you probably should if you don't know what you're doing and if you don't have the resources to understand yeah. but like you can do that work too once mm -hmm. you have that understanding all by yourself and right. it's not just this timeline i can go mm -hmm. into my mother's timeline I can go mm. into my father's timeline because it always, mm. it always, I was so curious growing up because my grandfather was just such a beautiful man, such a lovely, articulate, uh, educated, docile kind of man. My grandmother, mm. that was another story. She was a bit mercurial and odd, but both of their sons were abusers. And I'm mm. like, where does that come from? Maybe one son because of something that yeah. happened, but both of the sons were abusive in the same way. And I wondered why, and then that was passed down. And my, my brother's reaction to that was to become docile like granddad. My mm -hmm. reaction to that was to be angry like my father, not violent, mm -hmm. but I had to, mm -hmm. a lot of rage that I had to deal with, but it definitely feels and felt to me like, this isn't even mine. Like this comes from mm -hmm. some other place. How did mm -hmm. it happen to my dad? Who's, who's before my grandfather? It felt like it was evident somewhere else. And so to do yeah. an exploration like that, I can see how powerful that would be. Yeah. I wish I, had, I wish I could have done that for my father because he comes from a line of abusive um, alcoholics. He fortunately was not physically abusive, but he was big and loud and angry. And you know, that's scary, scary. but scary. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think now, cause he was, he was a wonderful person when he wasn't drunk and right. he had a big heart and he had a great laugh and and if I, if he could have lived another, he died at 65. And so if he could have lived another 20 years, he could have had a great impact on my children, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I now know that I could have done some work with him that probably could have released a lot of those demons that he carried for the family line. And thus also help, you know, my grandfather, my great grandfather, you know, et cetera. But I didn't know then. And uh, well, you, you can know. still do it. In the imaginal mind. Yeah. You well, actually, I have worked with that in, in the family constellation some too, because I have a son, you know, right. so I don't want yes. him carrying that forward. Um, and so, yeah, so I have done some of that with it. Um, and so, yeah, in, in, in his afterlife, perhaps dad will not have to bring that stuff back with him again, but. Um, right. But it's, it's fascinating work. It's just so fascinating when you start thinking about how <laughs> everything is. is connected mm -hmm. and nothing is static 
it's all moving. It's showing yeah. up somehow. It's just yeah. whether you're noticing where it is and yeah, you know, your intention around that. Definitely. Well, I had one last question for you mm -hmm. um, before before we start to conclude, but I noticed you write romance novels. Mm -hmm. I just find that so interesting because I used to write romance when I was yeah. a kid. And can I just take a moment to tell you something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every time I wrote, I started writing, we had those black and white composition books when we were oh, kids, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. And that's the marble and I, cover. <laughs> right. And I would write in those books. I would like wrap them up in tin foil because I wanted them mm -hmm. to be special and shiny. Mm -hmm. And I would always write about romance, like mm -hmm. the boy that I, I would always envision a certain kind of boy. And as I got older and I wrote romance into my teens and into my twenties, I always envisioned a certain protagonist mm -hmm. by his eye color, uh, by his stature. This was always the guy I was writing. Um, I would change it up, obviously, but that's who I was always in in my imagination engaging with. Mm -hmm. Then I got married the first time. I actually thought, well, that's the guy I'm going to ultimately meet. It must be. Mm -hmm. And I got married the first time. I married, you know, uh, that wasn't him. Got married the second time. <laughs> also <laughs> not him. <laughs> and then I kind of gave up on it. I'm like, okay, well, that was just, you know, my fanciful imagination. And um, when I gave up on it and I was single, I met my now husband who truly, and I'm telling you, looks exactly like the person I wrote <laughs> since I was like six or seven years old, same mm -hmm. eyes, same stature. And um, it was just, I realized I was just part of the creation and calling it into my experience. Mm -hmm. Like writing is actually like magic in that way. It is. Yeah, so it is. talk to me about the intersectionality of your spirituality with your writing. And if you can tell us a little bit about your stories that you write, I just, I'm so very curious. Okay. So I, um, I'm not currently writing novels at this time because I got into the healing stuff, but I have written six medieval Scottish romances. Wow. Yes. So I love the medieval time period because in that culture, women were very equal to men. Um, were they? and yes. Oh, I did not. Yes. I did not know that. Yes. Okay. Um, and, uh, also, it, any of that, the, like the high fantasy stuff, the Lord of the Rings, you know, all that stuff, which I loved as a kid and as well as a teenager, um, it, it, a lot of it is based on the British Isles mythology and, and culture. So I just have an affinity for it. Um, and my mother's family is from there. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, the, they're, they're Magruders, but that's the McGregor clan. So I... I've been immersed in the, in Scotland since I was 10 years old. I went to my first clan gathering here and it's the clan with the C, not the clan with the K. Right. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Yes. I am from the deep South. So it's important. You're right. Um, so, um, yeah, so I just, I was just fascinated with it. And I, I, when I think my husband and I had been married for a couple of years and I almost threw a book across the room because I was a voracious reader and mostly reading sci-fi fantasy stuff. And I was just pissed because it was so badly written and yet it got published. And I was like, ah. he, he right. says to me, why don't you write your own book? And I was like, I could do that. <laughs> Never occurred to me that I could write a book. I was a voracious reader. So I started looking for what I wanted to write and I landed finally on romances. And then I discovered Scottish romances and I thought, well, there it is. That's what I'm going to write. Um, my very first book, it's called The Devil of Kilmartin, and it's set in the Kilmartin Glen, and there's a lot of stone circles there. I've been fascinated by stone circles my whole life. Um, and so I set it there, and the heroine is, and this is, I was, this was years before I knew that I could do the things I do now. My heroine was a healer, and she used energy with her hands. See, <laughs> calling it forthright. <laughs> I, I know. Now it's a little more dramatic in the book than, than, you know, what I do, but it's, um, because you know, it's a book, you gotta be a little more dramatic, but I, I look back at that and go, oh my God. And I wrote it in a way that I experience now again, a little more extreme, but for her, it was, it was painful to do healing work. I get pain in my body that tells me where to go on the client's body. Um, you know, so, and then I wrote two that were just straight historical romances. There was no magic in them at all. And then my last three books are a trilogy and I went full out with the, with the 
the, the spiritual magic basically. Awesome. Um, and I still had not started on this journey when I was writing those books. I know that the third one was definitely channeled by the point I got to that one. I kind of knew it could feel the energy of it, but in the first one, I have uh, uh, someone who is telekinetic. I am not telekinetic, but I had to describe how she felt energy in her body. And it's exactly the way I feel energy in my body. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. Right. And one of them is a healer. One of them is, is um, a, she's, her, her strategy is her, her big deal. Um, but it's about, it's about these three women coming into their awakening basically to their gifts and how they have to use that to, you know, to, to save the world basically, because it's, you know, got to beat the English King back right, from Scotland right. kind of thing, you know? <laughs> right. Um, so it's, it's amazing to me that I, looking back on those, how right I got it without knowing that mm -hmm. this, that I was writing my own life basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it, I, I, I did, yeah. Did I call it in? Did I already have it that I didn't know it? I certainly called it fourth. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, that's so awesome. That is really, I'm going to have to pick up your books and I'm going to have to have a read. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do love me a, a nice romance. I gotta oh, say. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it, it writing novels. I love it, but it mm -hmm. is all consuming. It is. I can't is. do anything else with that. Cause you got to hold so much in your head at all yes. times to keep all the parts moving. And so I could never do the healing work in the podcast. And all the all things, other right. stuff. So, um, so yeah, it I is. will be turning to nonfiction. I just, I'm working with a friend um, on a collaboration project that we literally just dreamed up this week. So fantastic. Um, yes. Yeah, so I will be returning to writing in a slightly different form, but yeah, well, we're going to look forward to it. Did you, did you ever read the books of Nancy Springer? Well, old, like seventies, eighties, um, white heart, Nancy Springer. Just wondered. I don't, it doesn't ring a bell. I have read hundreds and hundreds I'm of sure. romances. <laughs> Well, it's more like fantasy and um, the, yeah. sort of along the lines of Tolkien, but you know, the, mm. so uh, yeah, it doesn't ring a bell, but it's entirely possible. I was big into Mercedes Lackey and Marion Zimmer Bradley and okay. some of their spinoffs. So yeah. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> well, I could talk with you all day about all I kinds know. of things. So I just want to thank you so very much for sharing your time and your expertise and just your thoughts with us today at the Life Magnetics podcast. I definitely want to um, get some information about how somebody might want to contact you if they would like mm -hmm. to schedule. I assume you you work with people one-on-one -on -one and oh, yep. you have to and, tell and us about what you do and how to contact you. Yeah. If you go to my website, which is heartlightjoy.com. Um, one word? You, yep. Okay. Heartlightjoy. All mushed together. Um, <laughs> and um, there, there's a, a way you can contact me if you want to send me an email, but also I offer a free um, call, you know, we can do a zoom call. Um, and like a consult, I love to like a consult. Like a consult. Yeah. Okay. Just so, you know, we can get to know each other and you can ask questions. I love to talk to people. You're not required to work with me if you, if you get a call at all. Um, but, uh, that's my favorite way to connect with people because I, I like being able to see them for one thing. And I think uh, you get to know each other and get a sense of, of whether it's a good match or not. Um, I also have a newsletter, so that's a good way to keep track of what's going on. If you sign up for the newsletter, you will get a free download. Um, my, I have a PDF of Lauren's top three ways to communicate with your guides. Oh, awesome. So, <laughs> so um, I encourage you to do that as well. I work um, in person if you're in the Williamsburg, Virginia area, but I also, I do most of my work at a distance um, and most of it is done via Zoom. Uh, these days, because I, like I said, I like to see you while we're talking, then we turn the camera off while, if, while we're doing the energy work. Um, and yeah, so contact me. I'd love to talk to any of your listeners. And I really appreciate them being here today. Awesome. <laughs> yes. And your podcast is the Curiously Wise podcast. Yes. Curiously well. Wise. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to check that out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm having a blast with it. I'm really I'm meeting so many amazing women. It's great. So awesome. Well, thank you again for being with us today. We had so much fun. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>